This is a special report from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. Welcome back to our continuing coverage in the trial of Scott Peterson, the Parkland School Resource Officer. We're up to segment number two of today. Let's go to the courtroom. Okay, I'm going to go back on the record. This is uh, State versus Scott Peterson, 197166CF10A. I continue to have Ms. Combs, Mr. Joe, and Mr. Klinger present for the state. I continue to have Mr. Igarsh present with Mr. Peterson, who likewise is present. We are outside the presence of the jury. The witness remains on the witness stand. State, anything you need me to address before we bring the jury back in? No, Judge. Defense, anything you need me to address before we bring the jury back? No, Your Honor. Okay, please bring the jury back. Jurors answering. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Come on in. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Come on. In. Ladies and gentlemen, once you're back at those seats, you may be seated. All the parties may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you using the notepads, I'll give you a moment to get those notepads back out. We took our quick restroom break. We were in the middle of the cross-examination of the witness. The witness remains on the witness stand under oath. Mr. Igarsh, if you are ready, you may proceed. Thank you. When you conducted the interview of my client, there was no pending criminal investigation, correct? Against your client? Yeah. No. There wasn't even an internal affairs investigation, correct? No, there was not. Just a moment. Yeah, yeah, no, that's the same. Go ahead, sir. Ask your next question. There had not been any, at that point, any public outcry at all? Objection, Your Honor. Hold on. I didn't hear the question yet. Go ahead, sir. There had not been any public outcry to place my client in any headspace that there was something that anybody was thinking that he did wrong, correct? State, what is objection the objection? as to the relevance. Yeah, that's the same. Just give us a lot of time to The client didn't come in with a lawyer, correct? That's correct. He didn't have the benefit of reviewing any reports before he gave his statement, correct? Uh, the only thing he brought was some paperwork that he had on Nicholas Cruz from the school. That's it. But nothing regarding, you know, anything else. Correct. Well, I think one of them was an official report that he had been involved in with Nicholas Cruz, but that's the only report I remember. Okay. But not my investigation, none of my reports were offered here. Correct. So he had no reports yet regarding what happened on the day in question, correct? No. Not that nor, nor was he given the opportunity to review any videos, correct? No. So he comes in there and he answered every single one of your questions, correct? Um, 
I believe so. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look. I don't remember any. He couldn't answer. In other words, he didn't refuse to answer any questions, oh, no. correct? No, he did not. And you've been in law enforcement for decades. You've become a pretty good judge of character as to whether you're seeing somebody who outright looks like they're lying to you, correct? Judge. Well, what's the legal objection? If the relevance as to his judge of character when somebody is lying. Well, that wasn't the specific question. That, as to that question, it's overruled. Go ahead, sir. You can answer. Uh, could you ask it again so I get the specifics? For decades, you've been interviewing people, right? 40, you generally years. can get a sense when somebody is lying to you, correct? What I end up doing is I listen to what people say and then I evaluate through an investigation whether or not, uh, I try not to be so open-minded that, you know, I believe I'm clairvoyant and I can tell somebody's telling the truth. At no point while you're speaking with my client for the time that he was with you, did you think right then and there, gosh, this guy's lying to me the way that he's speaking to me. Correct? Objection, Your Honor. Yeah, that's insane. thing. You tell my client that you're conducting this interview in a chronological order, correct? Yes. And that means you go from the beginning, and then you say, and then what happened after that, correct? Well, it's got a reverse chronological, from the day of the shooting, then backwards with Nicholas Cruz's background. That's correct. This, the interview that you conducted of Nicholas Cruz, which lasted for hours, how long was that transcript? How many pages? I have no idea. I mean, hundreds, correct? Again, I have no idea. This was merely 36 pages, correct? Yes. And up to page 16 is all that you discuss about what happened that day, correct? Um, yeah, it looks like 15, 16 words. We start going into the background. Right. So from page 17 on, all the way to the end, there's no discussion at all about what happened on the day of the shooting, correct? Uh, towards the end, when I make that comment, is there anything else about the day of the shooting? or? Other than that one question, there's nothing from page 17 to 36 where you discuss any further details about what occurred on the day of the shooting. Isn't that correct, sir? Um, not particularly that I can recall, but I'd have to read every page. I know, I know we talked about the fire alarm and protocol and what to do a fire alarm versus an active shooter situation, but that was more a general question right. rather than the day of the in, in fact, at the top of page 17, you say, you start off with, Cruz, all right, how long have you known Nicholas Cruz? Yes. You, you shift your discussion to him, correct? Yes. Okay, so let's focus on the first 16 pages. Okay? Okay. And one of the first things that he tells you is that prior to hearing the fire alarm, Scott was in his office researching a statute concerning a student who had a fake driver's license. Isn't that correct? What page? Yeah, just so I can refresh my memory. I know he said he was doing some fraudulent driver's license investigation. Okay, you remember that, correct? Yeah. It, in your research, did you find that that was a, the truth or a lie? No objection, Your Honor. Yeah, that's, that's the statement. Okay. Did he tell you that the student's father was coming to the campus and he was going to meet with him? Do you remember him telling you that? I didn't have to look at the page. That sounds accurate, but if you have the page number, I can refresh my memory as we go. Okay. My question is, do you remember him telling you that? Somewhat, yes. Okay. I think he said right. something to me here. He may have contacted him on the phone, uh, is the way I remember it, but uh -huh. that's right. And he tells you that he was in Building 1 prior to the fire alarm going off, correct? Yeah, I believe he said he was in his office, which is in Building 1. Okay. And that is quite a distance from the 1200 building, isn't that correct? It's probably two buildings. And. When he tells you that he was in the administrative office in Building 1, you were able to confirm that by watching the video, correct? He was near the, the 100 building. He was not, as I recall, he was not in it. He was down towards, uh, I think it was a cafeteria down there, that area. Is it your statement that he wasn't in the 100 building and then went out of the 100 building? I just remember him being in the hallway. Okay. Uh, and as he approached, going to the 1200 building, there's a golf cart which would have been in front of his 
where his offices were, but he was not in that office. And when he tells you that he got up, that Andrew Medina drove him and Greenleaf to the 1200 building, you confirm that on the video, correct? Again, you, if you have the page number, I know that's what happened based on the video. Okay. I don't recall him actually saying that. Someone could I know be, he said he, he, he didn't see the golf cart originally that he normally gets on. That's correct. Somebody could be inaccurate, but not necessarily be a liar, correct? Sure. In other words, if he tells you that he didn't see someone leaving the 1200 building during the shooting, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's lying about it, correct? Objection, speculation, and opinion. Yeah, that's sustained as the book. Are, are you familiar with something called tunnel vision? Yes. Tell the jurors what tunnel vision is. Tunnel vision, and again, this is my interpretation of it, is usually when you're involved in an encounter where you're personally under stress, as in a policeman, where you're being fired upon, where your vision becomes tunneled, where you don't see outside that, quote, tunnel. Okay. And so, in other words, things could be blocked in the periphery because you're focused, laser focused on something right ahead of you, correct? That's the term tunnel vision, yes. And you're familiar with the fact that a number of officers were going through tunnel vision while they're at the scene because this was very stressful, correct? Well, no, that's overruled. I don't want you to guess there. If you have personal knowledge, you can answer the question. Uh, unless you can show me a statement to, that says that, I don't recall anybody saying that to me personally. Okay. And what about auditory exclusion? Are you familiar with that? Uh, yeah, I've heard the term as well. Okay. Tell the jury what auditory exclusion is. That you, again, under my terminology is you're the officer being fired upon. Sometimes you may not hear. Um, Certain, certain things that are occurring. There were a lot of people who didn't hear all of the shots fired, correct? Objection, relevance, hearsay. It, it, it's a statement as to hearsay. Did you interview people to determine how many shots they heard? Uh, yes. Did anybody say they heard all 140 some odd shots? Objection, hearsay. Well, yeah, that is hearsay. That's me for not a court statement. That's the same. You are familiar with the fact that the students on the third floor didn't even hear the shots on the first floor, correct? Objection calls for hearsay. Yeah, that's the same. Did you watch the video of the students coming out into the third floor? Yes. Did you know what their demeanor appeared like? Um, yes. That demeanor changed from calm, did it not? Well, there's, there's so many different students. Some of them went from calm to panic, yes. Okay. And that panic occurred because the shooter went on to the third floor and began shooting, correct? Objection, lack of personal knowledge. Yeah, that's the state. Now, when you ask my client about how many shots he heard, there's one question that deals with that, isn't that correct? Uh, there's one question, but multiple answers during the statement. He he talks about how many shots he heard you, after I asked that question. Well, it, it's in evidence, so let's let's talk about it, Judge. If I can okay. get this on, please. Page nine. You agree on page nine at the very bottom. This is the first time you ask him the question all the way at the bottom. This is the first time that you ask him about how many shots he hears. Isn't that correct? No, but he answers above the, on, from the bottom where he hears the gunfire, but I ask him the amount on the bottom. Of the okay, case. so the first time you ask him about the amount, and the only time you ask him about the amount, correct? Yes. All right, so that question is, okay, you say, okay, all right. Once you uh, get closer and you hear those guys, w w what guys were you referring to? Read the paragraph before that. Uh, again, 
again, I don't know what the guys refer to. I'd have to make sure it's an accurate transcription, which I believe it is, but I don't, I don't recall what guys. Did you, I, did you have an answer? I did. I just did answer it. Want me to repeat it? I don't know what the guys refers to, so I'd have to make sure from listening to the actual audio statement and it's accurate. But I don't remember what guys it was. Those are your words. So that, that's the transcription of what I asked. But the best evidence is the actual audio recording. So, so I'd have you, to listen to the audio recording. As you sit here today, you don't know what you. What guys you're referring to? That's what I just answered. Yeah, I'd have to listen to the audio recording. You do say, all right, okay. You uh, you get closer, and you hear those guys. Mm -hmm. How many rounds do you think you heard? Yes. And his answer is, it wasn't many, two or three. That was his response, correct? Yes. And isn't it a fact that two or three is the exact number of shots that went into Aaron Feist? Isn't that correct? Two went into Aaron Feist, yes. Okay, so that was accurate. If he's referring to when he arrives at the building and he hears the shots fired, two would have been accurate, correct? Objection, counsel testifying as to what is accurate and what is inaccurate. Yeah, that's the same. So this is the only time in this deposition, strike that, this is the only time in this statement that you ask him how many shots that he heard, correct? So the time I ask how many shots, yes. Isn't it a fact that at no time do you say how many total shots did you hear from the time that you arrived to the time that you hear no longer any shooting? No, I did not use the word totally. Uh, again, he talked about it later in his statement to clarify what he was telling me. Is it your testimony that at no time do you ever think to say how many total shots did you hear? It was very clear from my question to him and his answers to me what we were talking about is he only heard two to three shots. But then the very thing that he said, that you say after he says it wasn't many, two to three, the next question you say is, okay, all right, what happens from there? Right? Yes. You weren't asking total number of shots. You were saying at that point when you're by the building, is that what you were referring to? Absolutely not. We're talking about shots being fired, what he heard. Because a little further down, he actually clarifies it again. In retrospect, do you think that asking how many total shots fired would make it clear for everyone? No, because I, again, think it was very clear in the interview what I was asking. And based on his answers, several times during the statement, it was very clear he understood what my question was. You've read the dispatch transcript to know exactly what my client was saying in real time, correct? Yes. He initially reports shots fired at 2.23.26, correct? I'd have to see the timeline on the time, but that sounds accurate. You do remember him again saying additionally, when there are additional shots fired, he gets on the radio and he does announce Shots fired, correct? Yes, and I believe you can actually hear the shots going off. Did you ever, as part of your investigation, ever speak to Anna Ramos? His name sounds familiar. I have to look at my reports. I believe so. Jeffrey Morford. Yes. To confirm that they heard my client order a code red. The 
police response part of the investigation was not conducted by me, but I, whether I asked them that and I put the statements, and it may have been in a statement somebody else took as part of the secondary investigation of your client and yeah. the other responding deputies. I want to cover some more of the statements. My client is doing a diagram for you, correct? Uh, I believe we had a, a map of the school. And he was trying to assist you by drawing things out, correct? Uh, yes, or pointing out with his finger. That wasn't included in this packet, correct? The, the state brought, no, I didn't see it in the Okay, so. it, it's not, can you just take a look? That drawing that he did, that's not part of what's in evidence there, correct? Well, again, I recall it being a map. I don't want to refer to it as a drawing, but no, it's not in evidence. Do you believe that he was assisting you as he was drawing for you? Uh, he was helping clarify certain things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the school locations. Mm -hmm. My client gave you the name of the student that he was investigating who possessed the counterfeit license, correct? Yes. Did you investigate to determine whether that was accurate? Again, that would have been part of the other response uh, investigation by uh, Inspector Riddick. Once I took this statement and the uh, outside video uh, came back from Quantico, mm -hmm. I had no further follow-up on that type of it's an investigation. He does give you her name, Marisol West, correct? Yes. Now, two days after the shooting, my client is telling you that he thought the shots were outside of the 1200 building, correct? I think he made some, and I haven't looked at the page, he said it was really close. Right. That those, those shots seemed like they were outside. Okay. And that was the two to three he was referring to. He did tell you it was very loud, correct? Yes. He tells you that he got about 10 feet from the building, correct? Yes. And that's when he heard the gunfire, correct? I believe that's accurate, yes. He tells you that he didn't get the opportunity to actually open up the door before he hears the gunfire, correct? I don't remember that exact terminology, but I don't think he said anything about opening the door, no. You ask him specifically if he saw any muzzle flashes, correct? Yes. And he tells you, no, he didn't, correct? That's correct. Was there any evidence that you discovered of any muzzle flashes that were visible to anybody um, watching the building when the shooter was on the second or third floor? Uh, the only evidence that I had which prompted that question was uh, the impact to the second floor windows. So that's why that prompted that question. Okay. And he tells you that he locked down the campus. He didn't want anybody coming on to the campus, correct? Uh, yes, that, that's what he did. Did he indicate to you it's because he felt that it would be unsafe for people to tra traverse in that area? I'd have to look at exactly why he did that, but that's what he did. You're trained also to keep people out of a crime scene, correct? Once the crime scene is secure, yes. Okay. He tells you that he's speaking on both of his radios, the school and the police radio, correct? Yes. And he indicates to you 
that after he announces the code red and the shots are fired, he realizes that he is vulnerable. He's out in the open, correct? If you can tell me what page it is, I'll get the exact terminology. Page, page 10. Middle of page 10. Okay. Yes, he's saying he's yelling for a lockdown code red. Okay. He's also telling you specifically, no, no. No, no, that's where I realize that I'm out in the open, in the middle. So then I go back, right at the corner of the 700 and 800 building, I go back. So he explained to you that, correct? That came from his mouth, correct? Yes. So he makes the transcriptions. He announces on his radios before he takes a position of cover, is what he's telling you, correct? Yes. And the video confirmed that that's exactly what he did. Isn't that correct? Well, again, the video shows him on the radio at the 700 building. I don't remember seeing the radio as he's running from the 1200 building to the 700 building. The video doesn't show it, but you see him delayed getting to the 700 building, correct? I don't remember much of a delay. I remember him leaving the 1200 building pretty quickly, getting to the 700 building. Okay. And I don't remember any radio. Did, did you speak to Kelvin Greenleaf? Uh, I personally did not. I know detective, or I keep saying detective, inspector, or, or special agent Riddick did. You're not saying that you have evidence that my client didn't get on his both school radio and police radio prior to taking cover at the 700 building. I'm just telling you what I can recall from the video, and I don't recall him being on the radio when he retreated from the 1200 building to the 700 building. I remember at the 700 building, clearly you can tell he's on his radio. Now, I'm just trying to be accurate on what I can remember from the video. I understand. But you also had the dispatch transcript to know that literally one second after Feist is shot, my client is on the radio announcing shots fired. If you show me the transcript to refresh my memory, I'll certainly, I'll certainly do that. He also tells you that my concern was because I didn't know if the shots were coming out of the building he brings that up to you on page 11. That another one of his concerns was that he thought maybe shots were coming out of the building. Yes. And my concern that's... was because I didn't know if the shots were coming out. That was another one of his concerns that he expressed to you two days after the shooting, correct? Well, that's part of the statement he made, but yes. We'll, we'll, get, we'll keep going, okay? okay? Just want to be accurate. Or were they coming somewhere out of the west side? That was another one of his concerns, correct? Yes. Because the west side is where Aaron Feist was shot, correct? Again, we're going to go east and west. West is, the school is the most east eastern building, the 1200 building. So west to me means anything west toward the 700 building, back to the 1300 building, to the football field. Feist was shot on the opposite side exactly where Aaron of where Feist he was, was at, correct? I know, I know exactly where Aaron Feist was shot. Over 73... Madam Court Board, can I do one voice yes, at a time? thank you, Judge. One voice at a time to the witness. The lawyer will ask a question, stop talking. The witness will answer the question, and then the witness will stop talking. Then the lawyer will ask another question. Go ahead, sir, ask your next question. Feist was shot over 73 yards away from where my client was. Isn't that correct, sir? When your client first got to the 1200 building, that is correct. And then here he is, again, saying on page 11, because it sounded like it might have been even outside, correct? Yes. And he explained, that's why I, you know, I went back to the corner at this point, correct? Yes. The, your training, and again, we're talking about training before 2018, before this. Your training, if you believe that you're potentially going to be harmed with gunfire. You're not trained to just stand out in the open, correct? Uh, you're also trained not to retreat from cover, yes. I understand. Okay, just trying to be accurate. But you are trained, are you not, to take a position of cover when you think that you might get hit with bullets, yes or no? Yes.
he tells you that I keep, I'm keeping cover on the east side of the building to keep them covered with my firearm directed towards the doors, possible with an anticipation if maybe if the shooter or whoever it was, which someone may be was going to come out of this door. Another one of his concerns was there might be a shooter or shooters coming out of the doors of the 1200 building, correct? Yes. That was one of the possibilities, correct? Yes. He never narrows it down to say, I knew there was a shooter or shooters definitely in the 1200 building, correct? He never does that in his 16 pages of discussing this incident, yes or no? No, not specifically. He talks about the 1200 building and then he says those are the things we just testified to. Right. And then he tells you about waiting and he sees an officer running right up in the parking lot up to a tree right over, yeah. right? That turned out to be accurate, correct? Yes. There was an officer. That was Officer Burton, wasn't it? That is correct. Burton never, you learned, went into the 1200 building, correct? That is correct. Burton was with Carl Springs, correct? That is correct. Burton had additional information above and beyond what any BSO officer had, correct? If he had his radio on, I would assume so, yes. I never interviewed Officer Burton personally. He says right here, it was, it was Carl Springs, Tim Burton, who was an SRO, correct? Yes. And Tim had a long gun on him, he tells you, correct? That's correct. And again, you're still doing this in a temporal sense, right? What happened next? What happened next? Chronological, because you say on page 12, all right, what happens from there, correct? Yes. yes. And he tells you that he's telling him, he's referring to Burton, correct? Yes. I heard a couple of shots, haven't heard anything since, and he's just taking over by, you know, behind the tree, I'm taking cover here, and units are now starting. There was a 26 second gap from the time that he hears the first shots to the time that the second shots are fired, correct? Again, that sounds accurate. I have and, to look at the timeline. And you don't know when it is that my client hears the next round of gunfire, correct? Not based on a statement, no. In fact, the last two minutes of the four minutes and 15 seconds of the shooting occurred when the shooter was on the west side of the 1200 building, correct? He is going, he comes up on the east side and he travels westbound. Yes. And then he abandons his weapon and goes down the west staircase. Correct. So the last shots fired were from room 1240, the teacher's lounge. Yes or no? Yes. That's on the opposite side of the building from where my client is, correct? Yes. Well, no, again, he's from opposite side from the part of the building where your client first went. He, your client went to the 700 building, which was like a third of the way down the building now. So your client, that 700 position is actually closer to the teacher's plan area than he was at the east doors. You're still talking at least over 50 yards at least. I'm just trying to be accurate. I'm just, you know, again. Yes or no, it would have been at least 50 yards, if not more, correct? I would say that would be close to being accurate. And the last two minutes of the shots fired by the shooter, Nicholas Cruz, came out of the teacher's lounge, room 1240. Yes or no, sir? Okay, say that one more time. The last two minutes of shots fired by Nicholas Cruz came out of the 1240 teacher's lounge. Yes or no? I'd have to look at the timeline. I don't think that's accurate. He fired 10 rounds out of that, that room, and I don't remember it being two minutes and 40 seconds. Isn't it a fact that he began shooting at 2.25.34 and he stopped firing at 2.27.35 out of the teacher's lounge? Yes or no, sir? Okay, I'd have to look at the timeline for the exact times, but you were accurate about the last 10 rounds came out of the teacher's planning lounge. Yes. And he's assuming a position of a sniper fire, is he not? because he's shooting at kids and or cops out the window, yes or no? I believe that's accurate, the last 10 rounds. 
And the active shooter policy states, does it not, that if you believe you're dealing with sniper fire, you are to isolate, contain, and wait for SWAT. Isn't that correct? Yes or no? Again, I'd have to look at the policy. I, I know the active shooter policy goes, you have to go to the gunfire. And it doesn't say specifically if you think it's a sniper that I recall, but if you show it to me, I'll read it. I will. Thank you. And if that's... It, usually it's if he's barricaded, you call for SWAT. Well, but if he's actively ask, killing people, no. I would are, say that's inaccurate. You, you don't believe that he's barricaded in the teacher's lounge? Barricaded and still shooting is a whole bit different ballgame from barricaded and not shooting. Barricaded with a guy in a gun, you call SWAT because he's no longer hurting or killing people. If he's in a room and he's acting as a sniper, you still have to go up there and get him and stop him. If you know where he's at, first of all, correct? Well, you got to find out where he's at. That's what we're supposed to do. That's right. The first unit, he tells you, are saying there's someone over by the football field, correct? Yes. He hadn't been able to review the dispatch transcript to know that there were officers like Kratz who said shots fired by the football field, correct? Yes. Correct. So that turned out to be completely accurate, correct? Yes. And again, he's telling you that he's making it very clear. In my mind, I was kind of, is he maybe running towards that? Maybe he's not even in the building. He might be somewhere way out over here. I mean, in my mind, I didn't obviously didn't know, you know, where the shooter was. And I started wondering if he had fled westbound at that point, because they're talking about people injured near this football field, just quite a distance from the building. You remember when he told you that, correct? Yes. And the football field is quite a distance from the 1200 building, isn't it? It's on the, again, we're going to go north northwest corner of the campus, yes. There's literally hundreds of yards between the 1200 building east side and the football field, yes or no? Yes. He does tell you that he assisted when someone came over and asked for keys, correct? Yes. And he didn't keep the keys from them. He immediately gave those keys to be of service, correct? Uh, it doesn't say time for him. He said he gave the guy the keys who asked for them. Okay. And you understood that to mean that he was being of service to somebody who was asking for the keys, correct? Yes. He gave the keys to the 1200 building doors to whoever uh, the SWAT personnel wanted. And you determined that to be factually accurate, correct? I didn't personally take the statements from those people, but yeah, I read the statements where that was accurate. And he made it very clear to you too that he gave the keys because he wanted to make sure that they had access to the classrooms, correct? Yes. And that was to specifically help the people in the 1200 building, correct? Yes. Do you know the name of these five kids who allegedly came out of the 1200 building? Again, that was part of the secondary investigation, which I was not a part of. All the police response part of the investigation was done by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. So I don't Keith know. Keith Riddick, correct? Well, he's just one of them. He was the main agent. I don't know their names. No, I'd have to go back and look at these reports. There's no evidence that any of these kids came running towards my client and gave him any real-time intelligence, correct? I'd have to look at his investigation because I did not interview any of those people. So I, I can't answer that. I don't know what they said when they were interviewed. He tells you, does he not, that he ordered Assistant Principal Jeffrey Morford 
to go to the video room, did he not? Uh, yes. And the purpose, he tells you, why he did that was to try to find out where the shooter or shooters were located. Yes or no? Yeah, Bob, well, that's logically, I believe, why he did it. I don't remember him saying it, but yeah, that's logical. And that turned out to be true, correct? Yes. And you were able to confirm that when Jeffrey Morford and Greenleaf were reviewing the video, that was being relayed to my client by the school radio, correct? Um, I believe so, yes. And you also confirmed that then my client was announcing what he was being told by Jeffrey Morford, correct? Again, I'd have to listen to the radio transmission, how Nicholas Cruz's name first came out, whether it was over Coral Springs, because by that time I think we had uniformed people got their way down to the uh, administrative building and were actually in the room when the video was being played back, is the way I recall it. So I don't remember whose radio it came across when I heard it. I just heard Nicholas Cruz's name come across the radio. So my question is, did you investigate to determine whether my client was on the scene announcing what he's hearing over his school radio that was coming from Jeffrey Morford? Did you, do you have any first-hand knowledge of that? I'd have to look at the radio transmissions. I don't recall him actually saying Nicholas Cruz over the radio. Well, we're talking about over the school radio. We don't have a transcript of that. It was exactly. not recorded. So did you speak to the witnesses who were around my client to learn whether my client was conveying that information over the school radio that he was getting from Jeffrey Morford? Objection. Calls for hearing. No, that's a yes or no question. It's overruled. You can answer that question. Again, the police response investigation was not conducted by me, so I did not interview any of those people. That I'd have to look at Keith Riddick's investigation to see if he did and what they said. It turned out, you learned, that the information that my client was getting from Jeffrey Morford was old. It wasn't accurate, correct? The information that they were putting about him coming down from the third to the second floor was 20 minutes inaccurate, yes. That wasn't my client's fault, correct? Uh, no, I don't believe so, no. Because, I, again, I don't remember your clients putting that out. And at this point, there's no question that the BSO police radios were useless, isn't that correct? Yes, but if, can I go back to that last question? Because now I remember how it came out. It came out through Sergeant Rich Rossman, who was standing aside of a Coral Springs guy and a Marjorie Stoneman Douglas staff member who heard the, he's coming down from the third to the second floor. That's who put it out over the BSO radio. Right. You Rich know where Rossman. they got that information from? The control room. And who was the control room speaking to? Uh, again, I don't know, because I didn't do those interviews. Gotcha. You're not saying it wasn't Scott Peterson who was speaking to Jeffrey Warford on the school radio. You just don't know, correct? No, because it's not recorded. And I didn't conduct those interviews because that was part of the investigation into the police response. That Keith Riddick did? That the Florida Department of Law Enforcement did, yes. Yeah. And he tells you that he was given a description by Jeffrey Warford, who was watching the video, and that description was of a subject who was wearing a male, Bert was a male, wearing a burgundy shirt, black pants, and black hat, correct? Yeah, what page are you on, sir? I'm on page 16 of 36. Okay. You remember him telling you that, correct? Yes. And, he to and you asked, and you got that description from a vice principal, and he tells you yes, right? Yes. And you say, watching the video, answer, correct? Yes. You confirm that to be accurate, correct? Yes. When my client tells you that he announced over his police radio, get the school locked down, gentlemen, you later confirmed that 
by seeing on the dispatch that my client did in fact do that, correct? Yes, I remember him. That part I do remember him seeing over the police radio. And you noticed that he asked for the lockdown or demanded the lockdown about five times over his police radio, correct? Uh, again, without having to review it all, I don't remember how many times. I know he asked for the roadways to be blocked. He asked for the parking lot, keep people out of the parking lot. Yeah, because school was letting out, right? Again, the terminology of why he was doing it, I don't know. I... But you, you did know that this happened in the afternoon, oh, right yeah, before was, school right. was letting out, exactly. correct? Sure. And you do know that parents, kids, would then be coming on to campus any moment, correct? I would assume so, yes. And it's consistent with training then to keep those people out of an area where they then may get hit with bullets. Isn't that correct? In this case, in my opinion, it was the absolute wrong thing to say to the responding deputies because it was an active shooting situation it, still in progress. It turned out to be in retrospect. Right. But when my client's there, not knowing where the shooter or shooters are located, and he feels that parents and kids may be harmed, training tells you to keep them away. Yes or no? No. That's inaccurate. He told the officers to block Holmberg Road. Some of those officers actually heard the shots being fired, and that direction was a complete contrast to what those officers should have done. Those officers hearing those shots should have rushed onto campus as well. Did you know whether those officers thought the shots were coming from the 1200 building or somewhere else? They had no idea. They didn't, correct. But they should not have been setting up a traffic post. They should have been coming on campus to find out where they were coming from. And that's what protocol and police work in general tells you to do. They were given the wrong direction. He doesn't lock down the school. Parents and teachers come, and then Cruz shoots and kills them. Objection, Judges. I, I've never heard a question, Mr. Agar. And quite candidly, I'm, I'm at the end of my patience with this type of examination. So if you have another question I do. that ends with a question mark, yes. you may ask your question. You said that you checked the transmissions that my client made in real time, correct? Oh, yes, I, I looked at the transcriptions, yes. So you were able to verify that at 2.28, my client is announcing to BSO, over his BSO radio, the last time we heard shots was between the 12 and 1300 building, correct? I'd have to look at the timeline to see the exact time he said that, but I do remember that. You also remember him in real time asking Deputy Perry if he knew where the shooters were located, correct? Yes, I do recall that. And then 18 minutes after he first announces that he, the last time we heard shots was between the 12 and 1300 building, he again repeats that. Last time we heard shots was between the 12 and 1300 building, correct? I'd have to look at the timeline for the time frame. You're saying 18 minutes. I don't recall him saying it the second time. I remember him saying it the one time, yes. Okay, you're not saying he didn't say it again, that's easy. That's why we do check. these timelines. If you give it to me to refresh my memory, I'll refresh my memory. I don't remember the exact times on everything on that timeline. Just on that moment. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Yes, Judge. Please. Detective Percio, were there any windows shot out of the 12th building? 
they were impacted. I wouldn't describe them as shot out, but they, they had been impacted by rounds on the second floor. Did any of them? And on the teacher's planning area. And did any of them shatter? Um, they partially in the teacher's planning area. Um, they didn't shatter. The fragments got out of the, the, uh, the third floor teacher planning area and ended up on the roof of the 1300 building. But the, the window. That's facing the football field, correct? Yes. Okay. And did Scott Peterson ever use the word sniper with you? No. Did he ever tell you that he was receiving fire? No. Explain the distinction between an active shooter and a barricaded subject. Again, uh, an active shooter, you know, again, is somebody who is actively shooting and or killing people. On an active shooter scenario, one of the uh, goals in trying to stop an active shooter is to get him to barricade himself where he's no longer doing harm to anyone, but he's contained in an area where he's not killing people, he's barricaded, you block all the entrances so he can't escape, and then you call in the SWAT boys with all their specialized equipment to get them out. Now, you said one of the goals, and earlier you disagreed with the term kill the killer. Why? The goal is to stop him from killing people. Excuse me. And that doesn't mean killing him. It means slowing him down. It means distracting him. It means anything so those kids can find safety. Why don't you order a perimeter? Because again, the goal is to try to stop them from actively killing people. You're also trained not to retreat from cover was something that you said. Can you please explain what you meant by that? If you have cover, you don't run across an open area to try to determine what's going on. You have cover. You try to determine what's going on from a position of cover and then move towards where the threat is. When he said may have been outside or really close, what building was he referencing? 1200 building. And now he admitted to you that he threw the keys from his position outside. He never entered the 1200 building, correct? No, he did not. And when he told you that he gave his keys to SWAT, that was after the shots had stopped being fired, correct? That is correct. He didn't do any of those things that he told you, and he didn't tell you in his interview that he did those things while the shots were happening, did he? No, he did not. Now, the problem with the radio was, as you put it, on um, how many people were trying to key up. Is it fair to say that the radio issues occurred after the shooting had stopped, once the shooter had left the building? Yes, I would say that's accurate. And the problem with the radios, explain where the radios fell on your priority list while you were on that scene. They were lower on my priority list because we were trying to get an active intelligence from anybody who was on the scene when the shooting was occurring and where um, the suspect or where the victims could be located. And that's because the person hearing gunfire is the source of active information, active intelligence, correct? Yes, one and of the best sources. The be I'm sorry, say that again. He's one of the best sources. And the whole radio, who's giving information to who? when someone's listening to active gunfire? Who's the source of real-time information? Who's supposed to be using the radio? Well, the, the person on scene who's the closest to what's occurring is the person in command. It's not a question of rank. It's not a question of position. It's the person with the most pertinent information to lead the rest of the responding people to what's going on uh, at the scene. Aaron Feist, and according to defense counsel, was shot at 2.23.25 while his client was standing outside the 1200 building. Did you confirm that those shell casings showed that Aaron Feist was actually shot on the west side of that building? Yes. And at that time, Scott Peterson was standing on the east side of that 1200 building? That's correct. And according to his own attorney, for 4 minutes and 15 seconds, his client stood there while gunshots were going off? 
uh, actually you moved from the 1200 building to the 700 building position for that period of time. And after retreating from where those gunshots are happening, he then remained in that position according to himself, the statement he took and the surveillance that he reviewed, correct? That is correct. And during that time, the shooter was on the second and the third floor while Scott Peterson was standing outside the 1200 building, correct? Uh, actually, he was standing inside of the 700 building, but yes, he was outside 70 some feet away. And so that was the two to three shots that killed Aaron Feist, the six rounds on the second floor, the 61 rounds on the third floor, so about 70 rounds all while Scott Peterson stood outside of the 1200 building after retreating to the 700 building. Is that correct? That is correct. And he told you that he heard two to three shots. That's correct. You said it was very clear to you that he meant that he heard only two to three shots. Why was that clear to you? Uh, because during the statement, he re-emphasized that once he got to the position at the 700 building, he heard no longer any shots being fired, and it got quiet. And um, I've actually hear, heard him make the same statement of two or three shots to other people. Judge objection, hearsay. Uh, it's overruled. Uh, it's a statement from the defendant. Go ahead, Ms. Gall, to ask your next question. Just a moment, Judge. question. When else did you hear him say that he only heard two to three shots? Uh, in uh, interviews. So, uh, objection. best source of information on the scene, the, the, the best source were the kids who called in to 911, isn't that correct? Yes, it would, they, would, would have been one of the best sources for the Coral Springs response. Because those kids precisely knew where the shooter was located, correct? They knew where he had shot people, yes. They also knew that kids and adults had been shot, correct? Yes. That information never was relayed during the shooting to any BSO officers, yes or no? Objection, speculation. Uh, that's overruled, sir, but I don't want you to guess. If you have personal knowledge, you can answer the question. Go ahead. The only uh, response that I remember was Coral Springs tried to transfer calls from those students to us and never got to us. So it never happened, correct? No. They never, the, tra the transfer of the calls never got to be a SOS dispatch. And we talked about Burton, but my client and Burton weren't the only ones standing around. And by that I mean taking positions of cover. Best was there, Carl Springs, Officer Best, correct? Yes. He didn't go into the 1200 building, correct? Uh, not that I can recall, no. And there were other officers who also remained in a position of cover and didn't go into the 1200 building, correct? Many of those arrived afterwards, yes, but 
That's correct. And many of them heard shots as well and didn't go in, yes or no? The only ones that, re that I recall uh, heard shots were the BSO ones that were positioned on Holmberg Road blocking the roadway. People like Miller? Uh, I don't remember Miller's name, but there were seven of them, I believe. And you, sir, you never went into the 1200 building, correct? Not until after I arrested Nicholas Cruz. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jack, if I could just have your name one second. State, do we have time to start your next group? Yeah, all right, this time to stay rest. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the state have arrested their case. Uh, there's some matters that I need to handle uh, with the lawyers, so I'm going to send you a lunch. Uh, it's going to be a slightly longer lunch. I'm going to have you back at the normal time, which is 145, because there's a few things that I have to handle with the attorney. So, uh, with the same admonition as always, please don't discuss the facts of the case, the evidence, the witnesses, or the testimony amongst yourselves or anyone else. If you'll leave the notepads in your chairs, they will be waiting for you when you come back. I hope you have a nice lunch. I will see you at the jury room at 145. 45 p.m. separate. Outside the presence of the jury, everyone can be seated. Can I just run to the bathroom for two minutes? Well, yeah, but I'm going to let Mr. Uh, Ms. Gomez here. Yes, you can go to the restroom. Okay. Uh, I had sustained the state's objections. I was going to allow the defense to make the proffers what additional questions they wanted to ask uh, the witness. We're outside the presence of the jury. Mr. Rodgers, any additional questions that you have? Yes. One of the primary reasons why you interviewed my client at all was because your supervisor asked you to, correct? Sergeant Jonathan Brown brought, he's the one who made the arrangements for Mr. Peterson to come down. So, yeah. And that was done because family members inquired about what my client was doing during the shooting, correct? That was one of, that was the one reason Jonathan Brown wanted him to be interviewed, but I was interviewing him for my purpose as well. Okay, that's what I would have asked him, Judge. No, no other questions. Um, I'm trying to think of the other. Um, honestly, I'm at a loss. I, I forget what else there was that had been sustained, Judge. So. Okay. Stay based on that. Any questions that you would like to ask outside of the presence of the jury? No, Judge. Okay. State is the detective excused. Yes. All right, sir, you may step down. Thank you very much. No problem. So while he's doing that, the state having rested their case, uh, I'm inclined to just send you all to your lunch break now. Uh, as soon as we come back, I'll hear any motions on behalf of Mr. Peterson. I'm not prejudging anything, so then we'll take it from there based on those. Mr. Aguilar, is that okay if we handle those motions after the lunch break? Yes, sir. Thank you. State, anything you need me to address before we take our lunch break? No, no. So uh, we're otherwise going to be in recess. I hope y'all have a good lunch. I'll see you at 145. That concludes segment number two in today's coverage of the trial of Scott Peterson. There is more to come. I'm Tony Bruski. Stay with us. This has been a special report from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. 